Hello, friends. Welcome to Heidi's Colorful Colorado. I'm your host, Heidi Ganahl, a wife, mom of four, CU Regent, and the founder of Camp Bow Wow and The She Factor. With a passion for keeping the spirit of our state alive and well, I started this podcast to bring the people of Colorado together to celebrate the amazing state we call home. Come along on this journey with me as I travel across our old country roads in my vintage RV, interviewing folks that embody the true spirit of the Rocky Mountains. From the Front Range to the Mile High City to the Wild West of Southern Colorado, we'll celebrate the history, beauty, and Coloradans that make this place the colorful state it is. Each week, you'll meet people trailblazing the way for an even more colorful future for us all, making a huge difference along the way. Are you ready for a Rocky Mountain ride? Let's do this, Colorado. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Heidi's Color for Colorado. Today, I'm visiting with an old friend, old friend being relative. Roman, we met back at CU Boulder many years ago. Yeah. You were an incredible entrepreneur. You founded a couple different companies, brands, nonprofits. I'll let you explain, but you're doing really neat work that are bringing people together from all over the country, all over the world, and I'm excited to have you here. Heidi, such a pleasure. Thank so you. So excited to be here. All right, so when did we first meet? What You reached out about a project you were working on, I think, at Boulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, so I um, started at the, the University of Colorado um, and was pretty interested in entrepreneurship. And you were heralded across campus as being like <laughs> the most iconic CU grad entrepreneur out there. So The I, dog uh, lady. <laughs> <laughs> there was like a giant poster of you in the business school. Uh, and I was like, okay, like I don't, I have no idea what I'm doing. I should probably reach out to the, the people who do know what they're doing. So, um, so yeah, at the time I was a freshman, was um, was really interested in filmmaking. And uh, my parents, immigrant parents, you know, going into the arts is a nightmare for immigrant parents. Um, they don't want their kid to be, you know, an artist, kind of like a a starving artist for life. And sure. so um, they really wanted me to go kind of more the medical route. So um, while I was at CU, I started off biochemical engineering, but quickly switched into the business school. And my dream in high school was to become a filmmaker, go down the film route. And uh, much to my chagrin, my parents didn't really accept that. And so it was at the University of Colorado in the business school that I, I realized maybe I could, you know, stretch my, my luck a little bit, just kind of build some, um, some trust amongst my parents mm-hmm. to say that I'm a business person. Um, while also starting a, a, a company uh, focused on on media and, and, and telling stories. So at the time, we were uh, partnering with different retirement homes in Boulder to tell the stories of the, their residents, uh, individuals in the community who lived a very long, uh, beautiful life full of insights. And really, the goal was to preserve their legacies for generations to come. And uh, the idea came to me because my grandfather passed away when I was younger and the only thing I really remember about him was sitting on his lap, uh, hearing amazing stories. I don't remember what the stories were, and I really wish I had a way to um, to listen or to watch them um, uh, after the fact that he's passed away. So uh, we decided that you know the technology exists, um, and maybe the, the the demand is there for us to preserve the stories, and memories, and legacies of uh, of. Um, of our loved ones before they pass. Um, so that was the initial idea whereby I reached out to you uh, to, to, to connect, and you were always very kind um, and willing to help. So Thank you. What a beautiful concept. And, you know, as as I get older and I want to you know, tell my kids the stories of my youth and kind of my adventures, and it's really hard to take the time to sit and just be quiet and um, contemplate what stories I want to parlay and to the next generation and how I want to role model for them. But that's really cool and really unique. And, um, you know, I've watched you on many ventures since then, and I've always had such admiration for your bravery in tackling really, really tough stuff, Roman. And I think what you're doing now is fascinating. So tell me a little bit about what you're up to. Yeah, well, thanks, Heidi. I I appreciate that. Um, I feel like there are a lot of issues in the world that um, deserve immediate attention. Um, And sometimes business models, and it makes it difficult to really try to tackle some of these issues uh, head on. So I started a a nonprofit a couple years ago, really 
because of how divided it seemed like our country was getting. Um, I spent a year um, doing some research in the behavioral science realm to understand how do we, how do we bring people together again, uh, especially in moments of polarization. Um, and several things became clear. Um, one is that it's very difficult. Uh, right now we've entered this, this era where we're unwilling to challenge our ide- ideological backgrounds because doing so is a sign of weakness. Um, people think it's a sign of weakness. Um, and we now construct our identities and our communities based off of, um, I'll say that again, we construct our communities based off of our identities, what we believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that hasn't necessarily been the case before. You know, our communities consisted of like our neighbors, maybe people we worked with. Um, but now we're kind of front and center is like our political ideology. And that's how we're constructing our in-group. Um, and how we're identifying out-group members. So it's really difficult to do so. It's very difficult to bring people together um, uh, in, a, in a peaceful way, to, to build dignity, to build respect across the aisle. Um, so that was kind of one of the, the main intentions going into this. Um, and I realized doing the research that one of the, one of the most effective ways to, do, to, to challenge that is by changing what is perceived to be a normal behavior, a normative behavior. And media is basically the the avenue that determines what is a normative behavior based off of the stories that we we hear on the news, in in films, in TV shows. Um, And if you think about it, the the story that's being told is that we don't have a lot in common. Um, There's a lot of hate that exists. uh, that whether you're on one side, like the, the, the opposite side is full of morons that, that don't know what they're doing um, or that actually have bad intentions uh, even. Um, and, and so we've been trying to figure out from a media standpoint, what are the different uh, levers we can pull to change this perception of what's a normative behavior, um, a normative way of, of, of getting along, of... Um, of engaging with individuals across the aisle, whether that's political or, you know, any other identity. Um, so that's what we've started to do. Uh, it's kind of manifested in many different ways. We started off doing a lot with virtual reality. We created uh, different VR experiences that place you in the shoes of people who you might not, um, place you in the shoes of people you who, who identify differently than you do. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, and it, that was really cool. We we got some some funding from NBC Universal. We bought a, a school bus, turned it into a mobile like VR studio, and took it on the road and um, got people to try on the headset and be placed in environments that are very different from their own. Um, they put on their headset and they're placed in you know the living room of uh, a Black Lives Matter activist, for example, sharing a meal with them. And, you know, that intimacy, for example, shows the humanity of an individual. Sure. Um, and so we, we focus on different identities um, just to get people to, to just feel that intimacy, be, like, close again, understand and, and realize that there's more in common than there's maybe uh, differences between between them. Um, so that was a, a cool, a cool uh, chapter. And then now we're working specifically with television writers and finding different ways that we can leverage um, mass market entertainment um, that's reaching millions of people to, uh, to normalize um, behaviors that really move our, our country and our world in a more peaceful, tolerant, respectful, uh, dignified direction. Well, and I don't think there's a more important thing to do right now than to try and figure out how to bring people together. And that's honestly why I started the podcast, mm-hmm. um, because cool. I thought... How do we reconnect folks, especially in Colorado? And, you know, I'm on the front lines as a regent in yeah. education. And I thought, you know, through people's stories. Like, mm-hmm. if you hear people's stories, you tend to humanize and, and take the defenses down and connect with them more real. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, what do we share? Well, we share a common love of Colorado. Like, pretty much everybody I know lives here loves our state for different yeah. reasons. Yeah. And I'll ask you these questions later, but I ask everybody, like, what, what's the spirit of Colorado mean to you? 
Like, what, why do you tell people you love living here? And then what's the most Colorado thing you do? And, and the answers are all across the spectrum, but this, people light up when you ask them the question. Yeah. And so if we can share that common bond that we all love our state, we just have different ideas about how to solve some of the problems we're facing, right? And usually the best solutions come from getting both sides of the spectrum together yeah. and negotiating a solution that usually is better than one or the other, right? I love it. I love it. I think uh, you you totally are, are communicating uh, or you're, you're talking about methods by which a lot of behavioral scientists talk about the importance of identifying a common identity, mm-hmm. right? Like that is one of the most foundational um, elements to bring people together mm-hmm. in a collaborative, uh, collaborative spirit. You're doing so with just the love of Colorado. And I think that is pretty universal here mm-hmm. in Colorado is just how much we love this state. And focusing on that as the identity, bringing people together is is a super effective way to uh, to challenge a lot of the maybe the distaste that might exist um, amongst individuals who might have other uh, identities or di- might have different identities um, uh, outside of that. So so good for you. Uh, that, that's oh, very well done. You know what you're doing. Well, no, I don't know about that, but it's a grand <laughs> experiment. And I I like to say every day is an adventure, and I've so enjoyed traveling the state and getting to know people um, of all different perspectives and ideologies and viewpoints. And it's really opened my mind to a lot of things and yeah. different solutions to different problems that our state is facing. Is there anything that you've seen that works really well to tackle this after all the work you've done? Yeah, I honestly think that um, intergroup contact is you know a very academic way of, of saying it, but coming together across mm-hmm. lines of difference uh, sharing space, sharing a conversation, um, seeing that there are other identities where you have alignment um, is is typically the best way to do it. Um, and in this digital era, what I'm a little concerned by is the fact that our, our, our mobile phones make it so that we don't necessarily have to interact with people that much. Uh, and maybe not just mobile phones, but even just like self-checkout. You know, you're not <laughs> having that opportunity to yeah. engage with someone. Um, and... I think like that engagement is really important and we're, we're losing the opportunities for that. And I think like actually one bright spot is, uh, is Uber and Lyft. I feel like, uh, those interactions between like your Uber driver and oh, uh, the best conversations best conversations, and like, you're always sitting with someone who you would probably never have like a conversation <laughs> with otherwise and like finding common ground and, uh, and seeing the humanity in them, which I think is really cool. Um, so what a great example. <laughs> I think I think uh, if if Uber and Lyft like doubled down on that, um, they could really do a lot of good and c- communicating it in a way where people are realizing how important Uber and Lyft are for for reconnecting, uh, for having cross sectional conversations, for for seeing people who aren't necessarily uh, in your in group or in your communities in ways that are dignifying and respectful. I think, uh, yeah, I, th- I think that's one of the things when I step into Uber, I'm always like, this is going to be a, a meaningful conversation. I'm going to make sure I'm not like just on my phone texting, but really like um, take the time and um, the intention to like ask good questions and to be present with the, the, the individual who's driving me. I think um, COVID put this on fast forward, right? Definitely. Like all of a sudden we're isolated. We're all online. Yeah. We're not having the, those communications and I was talking to another guest earlier today about how the glee and the joy that people feel when we go to events now or walk. This is my favorite thing, walking into a coffee shop and hearing the buzz Mm. and the sounds and smells. I miss that. I I miss that that so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the first thing you did when when things started opening opening up again? What what was one of the things that you really missed? Um, You know, I think... I missed going to the gym, like mm, just the yeah. experience of, <laughs> which I never thought I'd say that, <laughs> but I went to this boxing gym and just, again, this, this experience, the smells, the conversation in the background, the human connection, looking people in the eye. Yeah. Mm. I am so zoomed out. Oh my gosh. I'm tired <laughs> of zoom. As people watch this podcast online. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to ask you about was your bus, because we have this podcast trailer yeah, that we're dragging around the totally. state. It's so cool to see people interact with it, though, and I think it opens up a different conversation and makes people more um, vulnerable, I guess. I love that. I love that. I, I, uh, 
I see my bus as like a character, right? Where you show up and we've driven all across the the country and we show up in like these really small towns uh, <laughs> with this like very like domineering like presence, <laughs> um, this like jet uh, metal like bus um, and people are so curious uh, about it. And uh, yeah, like it, it, it invites them in. Uh, a lot of people just like come out of curiosity and it's like a way to have a, a just even even a short conversation, but engage with somebody uh, just based off of that. So I feel like it's a, a beautiful thing to have something that catalyzes people's curiosities and um, intrigue enough to just like engage with them. That's a great uh, way to put it. Yeah, it's curiosity. <laughs> You're it right. Is, it is, yeah. And that's yeah. lacking. It's so lacking. I mean, mm. people are so in their heads and their spaces, and hopefully that'll change since COVID's kind of moving out now. But um, tell me about Pop Shift and the series of events that you're doing. It's super impactful. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, so um, Pop Shift was inspired by uh, a story I heard um, a couple years ago, and it's the story of how in the 1980s uh, the rate of drunk driving in the United States was at an all-time high. And people were trying to figure out what to, t what to do about it. And um, a Harvard professor decides to look outside of the U.S. and finds out that in Sweden – they have a really low rate of drunk driving. And so upon further investigation, he realizes that in, in, in Swedish, in the, in, in the language, they have a term that doesn't really exist anywhere else in the world. And it's the term, that the, the concept of a designated driver. And so this professor comes back to the United States with this insight. You know, maybe there's a causative effect between the fact that they have a term, designated driver, and the fact that they have actually a really low rate of, of drunk driving and deaths caused by drunk drivers. So he tries to popularize designated driver uh, in the United States and it doesn't really take off. Um, it's not really sticky, it doesn't really work um, until he meets the writers of Cheers, the popular uh, 1980s sitcom. Oh yes, Cliff Clavin, man. I, I refer to Cheers all the <laughs> time. <too>. Awesome. <laughs> Well, I admittedly have never watched Cheers, so oh, I talk about it all the time. Out, I know, I hear it's amazing. But <laughs> I've seen the one episode where the, the writers of Cheers decide to integrate the term, the, the concept of the designated driver in their in their show, and lo and behold, tens of millions of people uh, are exposed to this concept, and it just takes off, and now it's become part of our cultural kind of vernacular um, in ways that have really shaped our behaviors. And so the insight for me was, here's this one moment where a Harvard professor has like an insight. And what he needs is a way to, to, to basically uh, move that insight, um, to, to create influence with that insight. Mm -hmm. So, um, so here, here's one uh, Harvard professor meeting one television writer, working together, changing behaviors, and probably, you know, sparing tens of thousands of lives, if not more, wow. um, through that concept. So we thought, how cool would it be if we brought together 50 experts on different topics and 50 television writers? What kinds of concepts could we popularize um, in mainstream t television? Uh, so we did that in October. We brought together some of the smartest, uh, coolest experts on different topics in the United States. A lot of um, New York Times bestselling authors, some of Ted's most popular speakers, um, um, MacArthur genius uh, recipients um, and we brought them together with 50 showrunners, 50 uh, TV writers and over the course of four hours they basically tried to brainstorm different concepts and ideas that they could popularize uh, on television so that was like the first event it was only supposed to be a one time thing uh, the TV writers liked it so much that they wanted more content from us uh, so we've created this event series where every month or two we bring together experts on different topics together with TV writers uh, to really try to motivate um, uh, tolerance, kindness, um, inclusivity around different issues. That's fantastic. I love that. Thanks. I love the Cheers example too. I mean, that changed things dramatically. I mean, now being de a designated driver is pretty cool. Like that's a, a badge of honor to be a designated it driver, totally I think, is. when yeah, you're out with your friends. Cool. They made it cool. And you know, as, as I was saying earlier, you know, the, the importance of normalizing things, right? Like, Cheers normalized this idea of um, be, being a designated driver. Not only normalizing it, but making it cool, like you said. 
Yeah. And um, I think there's a, a huge opportunity amongst television writers to continue to, to do that with different topics, uh, from different issue areas. Um, so, yeah, we've been trying to create a, a way for television writers to use their influence in ways that really move our, our world in the right direction. Yeah, and I think the media and, and entertainment, per se, is so impactful. And especially now that, you know, we are so stuck to our phones and our Netflix series and, yeah. you know, not even necessarily TV, but everything else that surrounds us. I think it's, um, I think it's brilliant, a brilliant yeah. approach. Well, thank you. Um, okay, so Roman, I get to ask you the questions now. Oh, bring it on. When people <laughs> ask you why you love living in Colorado, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's... It's, it's hard to just identify one, one reason. Um, I was born here, and at first, you know, I think Colorado in the 19, I was born in 91, um, was kind of like a random place to just be. Uh, <laughs> no one, like, chose to be from Colorado. It was the um, Wild West. Wild West, of course. Um, and since then, I feel like a lot of people have, have chosen Colorado as the place to be. And I think, like, what I love the most about that is the fact that Colorado has this cool vibe where what you do isn't everything the work that you do isn't everything it's not your entire identity um and instead there are other other elements that you really hold on to whether it's you know your favorite outdoor sport or your favorite you know concert venue um and um and i i really think that that's important because i've seen for myself getting kind of overworked becoming kind of a workaholic and Colorado has actually been so good for me uh, to not fall into that trap um, to, to go outside for a bike ride or for a trail run or skiing or cross country skiing or mountain biking or rock climbing. Goodness gracious. Right? It's like, there's so much to do. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it's, it's always appealing to me to just go outside and go for a walk and, and do one of those crazy adventures um, and, and forget or and remember that there's more to life than just the work that you do. Yeah, I mean, even when I walk outside and go in my neighborhood, I see the mountains, and or you yeah. see the storms rolling in, or yeah. you see the flowers as you walk by. There's just beauty everywhere. Oh, uh, everywhere. It's so beautiful. It's it's easy sometimes to forget, right? Like, <laughs> I, I lived in Boulder for quite a while, and I lived at Chautauqua Park, which is oh my the most iconic it's place. Gorgeous. And sometimes I'd forget to look at the flat irons, and then uh, sometimes I'd remember that, and I'd look at them, and I'd be like, moved by the, by the by the beauty of uh of the mountains and so yeah it's such a beautiful place to be yeah and hopefully we can keep it that way i know we gotta we gotta train all these new folks moving in from out of state <laughs> you know how to how to be a good coloradan right yeah that's true that's true it's they'll, part they'll of this too it it's like <laughs> if they hear the stories of people and, and what we value about colorado then i mean i think they mostly share it but uh just get letting them get to know the people of colorado yeah and yeah, how we roll for sure well, okay, so one last question. You, you answered this a little bit because you listed off all the crazy <laughs> stuff you do that's very Colorado, but what's the most Colorado thing you can think that you've done? I don't know. I, I feel like one of the things that came to mind was um, hiking a 14er in Chaco's and then going down afterwards to a, uh, a bluegrass concert whoa nice and drinking uh dale's pale ale <laughs> <laughs> just like the idea of like being on, on on top of mountain one hour and then a couple hours later being like in a crowd of people listening to bluegrass i was just like can't get better than this that's pretty good um one of our other guests said that her mom had climbed a 14er and golfed in the same day oh, nice. i was like that's pretty colorado that's pretty cool. so yeah. that sounds similar yeah. Yeah, but you got to add one thing to that experience and that's gq barbecue oh my god i, I cannot we're gonna wait go up. yep <laughs> we're gonna have some uh, uh jason would be proud he's actually at the kansas city barbecue festival right now oh is that like an award kind of festival is well he gonna they, they bring, bring in some, some of the best barbecue cooks in the country, mm -hmm. and they, it's just an expo. But, um, yeah, it's hanging out, drinking bourbon, eating barbecue, cooking barbecue mm -hmm. for yeah. several days. It's life a rough life. <laughs> he leaves me with all the kids and the dog and the cats. And <laughs> well, it's better in Colorado, so come back. Dad. Yeah, Dad, yeah, take that. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for spending some time so with us. Yeah, How can pleasure. people follow you on social media or get to know what you're up to? Yeah, totally. Um, so uh, the Pop Shift event, uh, our event series for t TV writers, uh, popshift.org. Um, and then you can find me on Instagram at Roman Vac. 
V A K. Uh, it's spelled Roman. Yes, that is uh, that is a good call. Roman is spelled R O M A I N. Little sneaky I <laughs> in there from my French mother. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, Roman, it's been such a pleasure as so usual, fun. and I'm going to keep watching you. You know, shoot for the stars. You're and doing likewise, amazing things. I appreciate how how much creativity you have and how you're always moving things forward. Thank you for joining us today on Heidi's Colorful Colorado. If you enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. And definitely follow me on Instagram to keep up with my latest adventures. In the meantime, happy trails from me, Heidi Ganahl.